This is intersection where faith, business, and politics meet. Our guest today is my dear friend and colleague, the Reverend Dr. Attorney Jeanette Wilson. How are you, Dr. Finn? How you doing? Good, good, good. So help us first, before we get too deep into this, Reverend, Dr. Attorney, how did, how did we get all these titles? What do they mean? What's the significance of that? Just kept going to school, <laughs> <laughs> trying to understand things. Uh -huh. So um, uh, everybody knows you, so generally what we try to do is uh, lay foundation with the people who know, but you're so known in this, um, in this media. Reverend, what we want to talk about today is uh, the recent election. Here we have history being made after a runoff or a election where two candidates stood to be in a position each other. Then we have one. Um, that you chose early on uh, to indicate that you thought that she was uh, a credible candidate. But what was your assessment early on about Lori Lightfoot? Well, I think that uh, Attorney Lightfoot has demonstrated her capacity to grow. She started out as, as a lawyer. She's been a um, U.S. attorney. She's been an equity partner in a majority law firm. And for an African-American, it's difficult. For an African-American woman, it is profoundly difficult. And for an African-American, in, the, 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 in the, either place, to be a U.S. attorney, mm -hmm. which is a, a United States prosecutor, really, mm -hmm. and then to be... Not a state's attorney. No, United U.S. attorney. St US attorney. Mm -hmm. And those are not elected positions. That's an appointed position. But you, um, and you're pros prosecuting federal criminals people charged with federal crimes. Mm -hmm. And then to go from that to becoming an equity partner in a major law firm, mm -hmm. that means you're not just make you're not just handling cases. You are now sharing in the equity of the firm. You're sharing the equity in this instance. The, the income profit. that's coming the profits coming to the oh, firm. Right. So you make sure everybody understands Yeah, she she's not uh, a person that's a junior partner. She's not even just a partner. She is an equity partner, which means she's sharing in the income the firm, and she gets to make decisions about how that money is spent. And so she doesn't just take cases. She's leading and making decisions about uh, you know, some of the cases. So I, I found her to be uh, a person who is concerned about the community. She's philanthropic and uh, always was able to support a community programs and then for her to be an openly gay black female who is also married uh, which is an unusual uh, state all of that um, said this is an unusual person and the kind of temperament she has is you know is one that says perhaps this is the kind of change that the city needs mm -hmm. competent administrator she's worked on the police board it chaired it She's worked inside the city uh, in a couple of departments. She understands uh, purchasing and procurement, which most business people worry about. And having been in business, she understands money. She's represented several uh, uh, different types of clients. And so that means she has negotiating skills, which may make labor feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say this, Reverend, we have, um, as we look forward and back uh, for Mayor-elect Lori Lightfoot to have won every ward in the city of Chicago. Every one of the 50 wards mm -hmm. um, has happened before, mm -hmm. but uh, we want to come back when we come from break and talk about the precedent setting uh, situation for Lori Lightfoot, Mary Light of the city of Chicago, to win the majority vote in every one of the 50 city wards. We're going to have to take a short break, and when we come back, we will continue our discussion with Reverend Attorney Jeanette Orson. Stay with us.
So, uh, Reverend Wilson, uh, let's just sort of unpack this, uh, this uh, Lori Lightfoot uh, victory. Mm -hmm. She won every one of the 50 wards in the city of Chicago. Now that has happened before. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think that in no instance, be it Richie Daly in 2007 or Richard Daly in 2003, was there such a spirited campaign? So what does it mean? And how, did, how, do, how, do, how do you explain this sort of across the board run uh, and win every one of the 50 wards? I think what happened? I think several things. This, this is a, a mandate against the Democratic machine. Mm -hmm. The machine did not turn out the vote for its Cook County Democratic chair, mm -hmm. which was Tony Pretwinkle, mm -hmm. President Pretwinkle. If Lori Lightfoot, a non-politician, wins 50 wards, all 50, it says that the Democratic uh, Party did not, the ward committeemen did not turn out any votes in their ward sufficient to put their candidate over. So it seems to me that there's a move against the structure, typical Democratic Party. The people that did vote, and it wasn't an overwhelming number, but those that turned out did not want the party candidate. And I think it says politics is changing. As you know, we don't vote a straight ticket anymore. There's no lever to pull Democrat or Republican. So people are now voting for individuals. And that's a change in how we vote means it changes who we vote for. So if I don't like you, I don't vote for you. And it's, it's, it just seems strange to me that only two people run it in the mayor's race and she won all 50 wards. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and so I, I can would, tell you. I would fire all of my party, my, my, <laughs> my, my local ward committeemen. They yeah. would all have to go. Well, they, I can, well, I can tell you this. They, uh, they didn't you're, deliver. You're too, you're, too, you're too young. You were uh, around, but you're too young to really have been in the guts of uh, Harold Washington's campaign. But I do remember mm -hmm. um, when the Shackman decree That's right. was operative yep. and patronage was, was no longer the rule of the day, which mm -hmm. means that uh, you couldn't be a worker in the city government and then be required to work for the Democratic Party mm -hmm. on an election. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Harold was the first person to recognize that. And we, in 1983, That's right. uh, he was running. And then, of course, um, he, uh, he carried um, enough of the wards to, um, to get in the runoff. But here's the point. Harold did not have the level of loyal support out of the Democratic Party. Mm. And so much so. They created another party. So much so, right, that a Republican, mm -hmm. Bernard Epton, Epton. almost, almost beat won. Him. Right. And so Harold then, and I was in the room, Harold was uh, saying, look, I'm not going to count on the, these ward commitment anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put my future. He then put, put together something called PEP. Joe Gardner and Leon Finney and Tony Gibbs were put there to put it together. And both of them are with the Lord now. But my point is, Harold said, we've got to have some alternative now mm -hmm. to help get our vote out. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we put together a structure. But the important thing is Harold Washington, the first black mayor of the city of Chicago, was the first mayor that I know that realized the weakness of the Democratic Party. Yeah, because see, they only delivered the, the uh, war commitment under Daly they knew they had jobs and they controlled uh, the jobs in streets and sand. Mm -hmm. And you know the other jobs, they controlled the major people jobs. Mm -hmm. So all the garbage workers were working for mm -hmm. 
So when he and that's all those garbage workers are still my friends. <laughs> they're my friends too. And you know, you say you had garbage workers. Not because they're precinct captains, because of but my they were the precinct captains. A lot of the police officers mm -hmm. on the north and the 18th ward, 19th ward police uh, were pre uh, were precinct captains, so they could turn out that vote. Now you don't have that infrastructure, and so Lori Lightfoot had to have an on the ground campaign mm -hmm. that turned out her vote. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I was shocked that uh, she took all of the city. I know, but part of what happened, she had the coalition of the other candidates mm -hmm. who did not win in the runoff. Mm -hmm. So she had uh, Chuy Garcia helped her out. He assigned his person to her. Mm -hmm. Willie Wilson took mm -hmm. her to the uh, black wards mm -hmm. that he won. Mm -hmm. So she had a, a, a different kind of coalition saying, mm -hmm. we're going to put our strength behind you mm -hmm. and I think that helped because she already had the north side the lakefront mm -hmm. and uh, several progressives mm -hmm. and so I think that coalition and the combination of people wanting a change said it allowed her to take it. Well for clear, clearly change within the wind. We're going to come it? back after our break and we're going to discuss the role of certain segments of our voters that voted April 2nd. Stay with us. We'll be right Reverend Jeanette, um, some of us have long realized the role of women in our movements. And need I have to go all the way back to Sojourner Truth in order to remind you that, or Harriet Tubman. But women, in particular black women, have lifted up and carried every major movement, that progressive movement that we know of. In some instances, with the abolitionist movement, they were joined by white women that fought to end uh, the slavery. But the important matter I want to raise is this. How do you see the role of women in this last election uh, as it relates to them uh, making it a conscious decision, uh, obviously, <laughs> to, uh, to support uh, Lori Lightfoot? Well, I think women are the majority of voters in America. Mm -hmm. And what is happening now, after the election of uh, President number 45, women, uh, we realized black women voted uh, overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Many white women voted with their husbands for 45. Mm -hmm. But I think in- 45 the, meaning Donald Trump. Yeah, that's- President Trump, yeah, okay. I just have trouble calling his name. <laughs> so, in Chicago, I think in the aftermath of the historic women's marches and women uh, coming to the forefront. Oh, that was the uh, January 18th March of 2016, right? 17. 2018. 2018, right. And so then you had the National Women's March, the Chicago Women's March. Mm -hmm. Women have started to focus on, on, on the empowerment of women. And so now in Chicago, you have a female mayor, you have a female city clerk, you have a female county treasurer, female uh, city treasurer now, and female lieutenant attorney. governor, mm -hmm. female Cook County state's attorney. Because women finally figured out we can run it. We mm -hmm. don't have to work through a man to do it. And I think that uh, women have just decided we can lead from the front, not from behind. Because mm -hmm. you know we've been leading all the time. Yeah, oh, no, <laughs> and, you, and you know since, uh, notice what I said, uh, every <laughs> movement that I've been involved in, and I've been involved in all of them subsequent to 1955, uh, I know when, as an organizer yeah, well. uh, that the first base of support that we could always count on in organizing uh, in the city of Chicago, state of Illinois, what have you, were women. And, and this is the hundredth year of women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. And I think, in, you know, you know the Bible, in the fullness of time, some things mm -hmm. will happen. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the fullness of time since Shirley Chisholm's run, mm -hmm. since um, Anthony uh, did the march for women's suffrage. Sure. And when you think about Fannie Lou Hamer at the yeah. Democratic Convention, all yeah. of Fannie that. Fannie Lou Hamer, right. I remember that now. She and got our run out. Too. They tried to shut up. <laughs> yeah, she said, oh, no, I'm going to do the, this. Uh, 1968 uh, yeah. Democratic Convention. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 51 years after Fannie Lou made her historic move and taking the seats, mm -hmm. we now have a woman mayor here. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's an unbelievable thing, a black woman mayor. 
a, we had a woman before, but never an African American. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jane Byrne, of course, Jane was Byrne. the uh, previous woman, and of course we did have a a woman in uh, in senior elective office. That was Carol Mosley Braun, yes, and she was the first senator. African American uh, United States senator from the state and I had of the, Illinois. Yeah, I had the uh, pleasure of working in her campaign in 1992. I did too. I used to be her surrogate. I, yeah. be, I was so excited. Yeah. Because I could speak to a crowd because she wasn't there, but the crowd was for her. That's right, right, right. Which Carol was, uh, and it was a great, uh, it was a great, great uh, effort. But what I wanted to just sort of uh, make sure that we get what has just happened. You have women decided to pick up Lori Lightfoot, Mary Light, and carry her across the line. Now, I'm not saying that men didn't help. Oh, they did. But no movement that I know of has sustained or survived without women. And I think women just said, this time, she's the one. <laughs> All right. We're going to have to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to discuss next uh, the church and uh, the stance of the church in, in the context of the uh, gay lesbian movement. Stay with us. We'll be right Reverend, um, the church and the Christian church or the Hebrew church or the church of uh, those who are part of the Islamic and Muslim faith, but in particular the Christian church, there was, I think, a sense of what happened as it relates to the church supporting Lori Lightfoot, and in particular, the African-American church. I, I know that during the course of the campaign, um, um, there were some sort of handbills or something uh, around the church, uh, the black churches. So what, you, what was your sense of the role of the church as it related to uh, the turnout that we see? Well, I don't think it played a major role in turnout. I do think that the churches were places where people could hear from the candidate. Both candidates, as a matter of fact, were going to various uh, congregations. And I think they began to realize that uh, there are a number of sins that we could preach about mm -hmm. and should. And, you know, the fact is, sometimes we've made uh, homosexuality and being gay, lesbian, transgender the only sin mm -hmm. that uh, requires any response. And so, I think... Wait a minute, uh, you said the only sin. And many people talk about it as if it is the sin that we must preach from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And that was what the handbill was about. The fact is, churches have always been places where people could get information and access resources. And I think that both candidates were able to visit various religious institutions, whether they were churches, temples, or mosques, and share information. I think that uh, unlike the past, people were not voting based on what the pastor or the faith leader said. They were voting based on what they believed and wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And the, and the uh, religious leaders did not have the kind of influence they once had. Mm -hmm. And now you have many of them trying to figure out how to realign themselves mm -hmm. uh, because so many were so aligned with previous mayors, lockstep, they don't have that, that kind of relationship. I think that this mayor is gonna be more concerned about the people mm -hmm. and not are only talking to the faith leaders, but really, you know, this campaign flipped everything into town hall forums mm -hmm. in community. And I think the faith leaders are gonna to have to begin to think about holding more meetings, town hall type meetings, where people can talk to the mayor or other elected officials. Because mm -hmm. it was also a signal, if you look at this election, and you know this stuff better than I do, several aldermen lost their positions or almost lost them because mm -hmm. they were no longer in contact with the people that sent them to office. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, my sense is that when you think on the church, and in particular the black church, you know, and I don't want to enumerate the denominations uh, that we all know, uh, there was a sense that this would be a difficult moment uh, for, um, uh, for uh, Mary Elect, Lori Lightfoot, mm -hmm. uh, in the context of the historic conservative stance mm -hmm. that the black church, quote, unquote, uh, represents. And so, uh, apparently, it didn't work. Uh, apparently, uh, all the scripture in the world uh, did not uh, deter people from making sure or uh, voting their preference on election day. And I think if, if, if you and I follow the Jesus model, his last night was uh, with Simon the leper. He, his position was all are welcome. And I, I think that this is a message to the church. All must be welcome. Because mm -hmm. now we're in the city of Chicago and the power of the church is to speak truth to power, not so much to condemn, mm -hmm. but, to, but to say this is what thus saith the Lord. I want you to pin that because here as I give you a scripture out of uh, the gospel according to John. Mm -hmm. It is at the tail end of the story of Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. And it simply says, Jesus is talking. And uh, he says, um, uh, I did not, well, after we say that, my only beloved son, and I give thee the blah, blah, blah. But whosoever should believe in me will have life and life everlasting. But then the next thing, that's verse 16, then the next thing is that Jesus says, I did not come to into the world to, to condemn, condemn the, the world. world, not even if you are gay or lesbian. My friends, we're going to have to take a short break, and when we come back, we will pick up our conversation with Reverend Dr. Attorney Jeanette Wilson. <laughs> So, Reverend Dr. Attorney Jeanette Wilson. Yeah, right. So, we've witnessed, I think, history in the making. And what is the history? The history is the first African American female has been elected mayor of the city of Chicago, which is without precedent the way it happened. I've been around a while, as mm -hmm. well as you, though you're considerably younger than I am. And, but here's the thing. Are we looking at a, a movement, or was this just an isolated election? Well, I think it's a movement. If you look at, and I'm sure you've analyzed the results to some degree of the uh, automatic races, there's a shift. And contrary to what many people think, it wasn't young people that elected her because they didn't vote in great numbers in this election. It is a movement, I think, in large measure because women have decided to take uh, some positions. You know, when I look at uh, Melissa mm -hmm. Irving. Yeah, uh, off from the West Side. Off from the West Side, mm -hmm. she's now the city treasurer. You look at uh, the role that um, our lieutenant governors played, Kim Fox, she was elected as a result of a movement mm -hmm. on the, you know, the whole Laquan McDonald case. And so I think that it is a movement and people are uh, moving forward uh, in the city and in the nation. You have black, brown, yellow, Asian, all of the ethnic groups are beginning to coalesce and, and to seek a, a different kind of power than they've had before. As the nation becomes uh, more multicultural, you cannot have an all-white male anything and feel comfortable with it. And that's the shift that we see. So businesses were thinking, well, we got to leave Chicago. Well, you, you can't leave because we're your base of income because we buy the products. Women do. Well, let me pose something. We're the great, greatest consumers. Let me pose something. And it just occurred to me. So maybe what happened in a, at the national level after women did not pick up Hillary, Mm -hmm. Maybe they said, never again. Never again. They did. <laughs> oh, I've, I've talked to several uh, white women, mm -hmm. and, and they, they now understand the mistake that they made. Right. And so they said, we don't have to do this right. ever again, and we're not going to. Mm -hmm. 
And I think as, as we look for, at our daughters, they have to know that our strength is not just in influence. It is in leading. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean every child will run for president or mayor, but we have the right to run. And our dollars matter like our votes matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to see a, a change in so, a lot of areas. So here's the thing. We watch the last um, midterm elections mm -hmm. and women, as you noted earlier, went into the Congress of the new United States of America in unprecedented numbers. Mm -hmm. That ought to be a um, signal right there and continue to sweep these elections. So we may not have a movement for the Democratic Party per se, but we do have a women's movement that has already been birthed and is operative now. And I think the Democratic Party has to look at women differently. They were having a discussion, and we have to have another show on this. Mm -hmm. The Democratic Party is trying to decide, well, uh, which candidate has to put a woman as uh, the second choice? How about you put us as first choice? Right. We don't have to run for second. We may become second. Yeah. And so they are even the way they're analyzing the women who've announced, they're trying to marginalize them, which I think is going to alienate uh, a, a voting bloc. Here's what I think. You That's now have Tony Preckwinkle, mm -hmm. who is arguably the single most influential black woman in the county of Cook as well as the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. She is the head of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. If we've got a women's movement working, let's look and watch out for how that she uses that position to advance social justice and the causes and the issues that women really care about. And the party, the national party has to not only uh, empower her with a title, but she has to have funding for this presidential election, for this census that's coming. In 2020. And for 2020. Mm -hmm. They have to use the position with her leading it as they did if she were a man. Mm -hmm. Dunn had the most power in the country, second largest county when he was president of Cook County. You Board. mean George Dunn? George Dunn. That was my personal friend. Your friend. And you know what? So, and you George know, Dunn and you know also broke with the party over Harold. Well, and he, in Harold's second election, he was right there. But she has to have the resources to deliver in 2020. And we got to help her get up. There you go. Listen, uh, it's been a pure pee-picking pleasure <laughs> to be with uh, you. He is going back to, to Mississippi <laughs> with that pee-picking pleasure. We ain't picking peas in right, Chicago. Right. But to be with you, Reverend, and to uh, enjoy this moment great. of, um, of a celebration, if you will. Yeah. Um, my sense is all things work together for, for good. good. To them who love the Lord and are called call according to his purpose. Expect good to come out of April the 2nd. This is Leon Finney, and this is Intersection, where faith, business, and politics meet.